seminar in our seminar series, which was entitled A, a Jewish Leadership's Response to Contemporary Anti-Semitism. Tonight, I have the distinguished Malcolm Moline, who's here with us tonight. In the past, as part of the series, we had Abe Foxman, Dave Harris, and uh, Mark Weitzman from the Seaman uh, Music Hall Center. Um, tonight's lecture by Malcolm Moline is um, entitled, Is It 1939? A question mark. Assessing the State of World Jewry. And just as a point of information, I think it's something that may come up in the conversation and perhaps in, the, in this lecture tonight, is that for the first time uh, in two, two years as the director of ISA and four years doing a seminar series on anti-Semitism at Yale, I think that this title brought out the most response from people. And I find it fascinating. The response, I thought, was actually quite emotional and very negative, um, the people who took the time to, uh, to write in. And I think we're actually in the process of uh, organizing a conference, myself and Edith Shalev, who's a new postdoc here, and we're actually organizing a conference that will take place in April that's dealing with issues of denial. So psychological responses from dealing with um, adverse conditions and how human psychology, in a sense, enters into processes of denial to cope, and to cope with serious issues. And I guess the question tonight, the question for us this evening and in general, are we entering into a state of denial? And uh, it's particularly the work that I do vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And the consistent threat that Iran is posing, uh, if you read their speeches, if you read the newspapers, if you read the policies, its ambitions, its statements, are we in a state of denial? I suspect tonight we'll hear some views on, on issues of this. So it's a great pleasure to have Malcolm Moline with us today. He's the executive vice chairperson of the Conference of Presidents of the major Jewish organizations, and he's held this position since 1986. It's the coordinating body of international Jewish concerns for more than 50 national Jewish organizations. He's been the president of America's Voice in Israel, the co-chair of SCAN, the Board of Directors and Advisory Board of several companies, communal, education, and civic organizations. Previously, Mr. Holain has been the founding executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council for the Greater New York Region, the central coordinating agency for Jewish organizations in metropolitan New York. He was the founding executive direct director of the Greater New York Conference in Soviet Jewry, the National Defense Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Near East Center. He was a professor of international relations in the Department of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He served as a Middle East Specialist at, a, at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, was, the editor, was on the editorial staff of Orbis, the Journal of International Affairs. Um, I can go on and on, but I'll, I'll try and be brief. He received a BA in Political Science from Temple University, a Master's from the University of Pennsylvania's Department of International Relations, where he also completed his doctoral work. He's written extensively on global, international issues, certainly issues in the Middle East, Soviet Jewry, Jewry in general, and the American Jewish community. So it's a, really a great honor to welcome you here. Just the way my mother wrote Well, uh, first, I want to associate myself with the remarks of all the previous speakers that you mentioned. I agree with all of them. <laughs> but I will, uh, I think, address this from a little bit of a different perspective. I don't deal with anti-Semitism in the same way that Abe or David or the Wisenko Center might. Uh, and I want to also address in the context of the issues with which uh, the Conference of Presidents is engaged. Uh, I don't know where you got the title about is it 1939. I agree that it's a very negative title. I mean, it would be a great concern that you uh, could have used it. Uh, you know, someone once said an anti-Semite is one who hates Jews more than is necessary. I think that uh, when, when we're going to try to address the subject today, uh, you know, you have to look at the ways they say how a Jew and, and an anti-Semite approach this issue. The anti-Semite, when asked about the Jewish people, said that people, they cheat, they think they're better than everyone, they're, they're not disloyal. And when you ask him about what do you think of Cohen, he said he's the salt of the earth. And what do you think of Levine, he's the best guy in the world. 
When you ask the Jews about the, the Jewish community, they said, look, they're the most generous, the most charitable, the creative people. They said, what do you think of Cohen? He said, that SOB. What do you think of Rabin? He said, that bum. So everybody has a different approach to this issue and different definitions about how you look at the issue uh, of anti-Semitism. You know the Jewish telegram, start worrying, details follow. I will, uh, I will try to address this issue with uh, the seriousness with which I think it, it deserves to be addressed because I do not believe that the community as a whole and the larger society is willing to address this issue and attendant issues with the seriousness that it deserves. And this is actually the right week because in this week's Torah reading, we read about, am I my brother's keeper? Where Cain poses the, the question, am I my brother's keeper after he murdered uh, Abel? And this sort of served as the rallying call throughout all the generations. And in fact, we see the two models emerging from uh, the Torah reading of last week where uh, you had two exiles, one of Adam and Eve, because of their violations against God, and then Cain because of his violations against man and humankind. And the next time when we were exiled from the land was first the first temple was because of violations of the law, uh, idolatry and other violations against God's law, and then the second temple because of Sinai came out because of the violations of relationships between humankind. So these are the two models of the kind of tensions that arise, whether it's on a spiritual level, on a very practical level. One of the things that Judaism imposes on us is the importance of history. We do not approach it as any other people do. It's not enough for us to read history. We have to experience history. And Jews look back not to dwell on the tragedies of the past, but to learn the lessons of the past. Winston Churchill once said, the further back you look, the further ahead you will see. Or will say whoever controls the past will control the future. Our sages said it a thousand years earlier, that they understood that only those who understood the past, who learned the lessons of the past, were prepared to meet the challenges of the future. When we sit down to the most observed ritual of the Jewish calendar, the Seder, we're told there is one of the most important passages is Behisha and there we recount the fact that the hold of regard, every generation, enemies arise and seek to destroy us. It doesn't use the past tense. It doesn't say that it sought to destroy us. It says that it seeks to destroy us. To remind us that in every generation, those enemies arise. The enemies from without and the enemies from within. And only those who learn the lessons of the past are prepared to meet the challenges of the future. And in fact, if you go through the Haggadah service, the Seder service, you see there are many lessons that are instructed for the challenges we meet today. And in fact, someone, a great rabbi once asked, do you mean to tell me that in every generation, wasn't there one generation that didn't face this challenge of anti-Semitism? And he said, you have to look at the next paragraph. The next paragraph is Te'el Amad, which goes, recounts the story of Jacob's conflict with Laban, who, as you know, kept him there for many years and working in order to marry his daughters. And all the time, Jacob was amassing a considerable position, wealth, large family, and thought life was pretty good. While all the time, Laban was concocting to destroy him. And what he says is that it's in every generation, meaning that it always going to have to be manifest, but you always have to be prepared. You have to look for the things that are boiling beneath the surface before they arrive if you're going to try to meet those challenges and learn the lessons of the past. The question that I posed was meant to be provocative. But it's not out of context, because there is a debate in Israel, for instance, whether this is 1939. You've seen that Netanyahu makes some reference to it. Paris said 36, others say 32. Frankly, it's the wrong question. The real question is, what lessons did we learn from the 1930s that we apply to today? There's no historical analogy that is perfect. But the fact is that there are fundamentals that are relevant and then from which we can learn. And they're universal. It doesn't apply just to Jews. It's for all people. Because what happens to one happens to others. 
And the truth is that over the generations, you can have a different color of uniform, different language, different geography, but the fundamental chain challenges remain the same. The baseless hatred that we've confronted throughout all the generations, the big lie that started in Egypt by Yoreo Asana Mitzrim, the Bible recounts how Jacob, how Pharaoh uh, said, did the Jews do anything wrong? Well, no. But he said, how about Ishmael? We have to deal with them truly because they're growing strong, they're important. But he accuses them of no wrongdoing. And he says, by Yoreo Asana, that they wronged the Jews. And the question was asked, why does it say they wronged them? It should say they did wrong to them. And the answer is given that that's the right formulation. Because before you could have people act against their neighbors with whom they lived for generations, let alone enslaving them, first you had to wrong them. You had to show that they were responsible for all the ills of Egyptian society. Adolf Hitler didn't announce a final solution. He first wronged the Jews. He said the Jews were responsible for all the ills that grew out of World War I, the Versailles Treaty, the conditions, the economic conditions, the social and commercial conditions. And when people were prepared to accept it, then he could move ahead towards the final solution. And he first codified it into the Nuremberg Laws. And then came Kristallnacht, which is at the 70th anniversary we will mark next week, when now we know, contrary to what most of the history books say, more than 1,500 synagogues were destroyed in the aftermath of Kristallnacht. Tens of thousands of people arrested, countless businesses destroyed. And when 300 reporters gathered in the White House a week later and asked President Roosevelt what his reaction was, he said, I'm outraged. They said, what are you going to do for German Jewish refugees? And he refused to answer and ended the press conference. The next day, a bill was introduced on the floor of the House of Representatives to allow 20,000 German Jewish children, refugees, into the United States. And it was Roosevelt's cousin, the wife of the Secretary of Immigration, who got up on the floor and said, 20,000 adorable children become 20,000 ugly adults. And the bill was defeated. Seventy years ago, they told us they didn't know. We know now from the archives that have been opened from the U.S., France, Great Britain, and others, and we have only seen a small percentage, that it was a lie. It wasn't they didn't know, they didn't want to know. They knew every day how many Jews were being killed because they broke the Nazi codes. The book Eavesdropping on Hell that was published earlier this year, there are other works that are now coming out which disclosed how the Allies had broken the Nazi codes. They knew even before Operation Reinhardt, when 2,224,000 Jews were killed in less than a 30-day period in Sobibor, Treblinka, Lublin, and three other camps. But they never revealed it because they were afraid the Nazis would know they broke the codes. I once asked the British ambassador why they didn't reveal it at Nuremberg, at the trials. Why did they wait six decades? Were they afraid then the Nazis would find it? But they didn't want the lie exposed. It wasn't that they didn't know, they didn't want to know. Today, we have no excuse. We can't hide behind any folk of ignorance because everything is available to us. We know everything. You go on cable television, you see it before it happens. You go on the internet, you get everything you can ever imagine about every subject, true or untrue. So the challenge to our generation is a different one. The big lie still works when it comes to you. We see it in particular in regard to Israel, but even in regard to other things. 25% of people believe that 9-11, the Jews got out of the World Trade Center, despite the fact that 800 or 900 died there. There are many other myths that continue to be perpetuated. That the Jews drove us into Iraq, and the Jews drove, are trying to drive us into Iran, and many others that the vast majority of people in many places believe and are given information that would lead them to believe. So let me first say that it is not 1939. I do not believe that it's 1939. It's not 1939 because we have a Jewish state. We have a Jewish state with a very good army and an air force and a navy. It's not 1939 because endangered Jewish communities could be saved. When I came to New York to head the Soviet Jewry movement, this Marvin may remember, people said to us, you're crazy, Soviet Jews will never be free. They said, you're giving up teaching at Penn and doing all the other stuff. You're coming there to save Soviet Jews. Because we had a Jewish state, the Jews of Russia, of Ethiopia, of Yemen, of Syria, of Iraq, and even of Iran, have been able to be saved. Jewish communities that were written off to Jewish history have been saved. 
the fulfillment of the prophetic vision of the ingathering of the exiles has been fulfilled in our lifetime. How many of us think about it and appreciate it? It's not 1938, 9, because I think American Jews are different. I don't believe that we are Jews of silence. I do believe we have learned the lesson of 70 years ago, and we demonstrated it when it came to the rescue of Russian Jews, or demonstrating for Ethiopian Jews, not being afraid to go into the streets and to demonstrate, and because we did, others did. It wasn't because of the Jews demonstrating, but because the Jews demonstrated, others came out. And it became a worldwide movement. That even when the 13 Jews were arrested in Iran, they couldn't resist the pressure. When 66 countries ultimately, and many Muslim and Arab countries included, spoke out on their behalf. So it's not 1939 because the anti-Semitism we face is by and large, with the exception of some Muslim and Arab countries, not state-sponsored and that most of the state authorities rejected. It is not 1939 because there are tens of millions of Christians who are prepared to stand up with us here in the United States and many more around the world. It's not 1939 because we have a Congress in the United States, Republican and Democrats alike, who stand up for us. And because we have an administration and previous administrations, Republican and Democratic alike, who stood up with the State of Israel and the Jewish people, who helped make possible the rescue of Russian Jews and Ethiopian Jews. It wasn't just Israel, it was within the alliance and association with the United States and sometimes even other countries. It's not 1939 for many reasons, but it could be. Part of the lessons we learned from history is that it is we who raised the bar of tolerance of what we're prepared to accept. It was the lesson in Egypt. God said, I will take you out of Egypt, we talk about Siglo from Shrine, from the oppression of Egypt, which the commentators say really means Salamut, the patience, that as long as the Jews could accept each layer of slavery, each additional punishment, and they said, okay, we can live with this, we can live with another step, and another layer, and another level. It was only when they said, no more, we're not going to take it anymore. Then God said, we're ready to be redeemed. German Jews accepted many of the prosecutions. They didn't leave right after Kristallnacht. They didn't leave after the, Nuremberg, after the Nuremberg laws were introduced. And they didn't go out in January of 1933 after Hitler was elected. And I suggest to you, go and look at the headlines from January 31st, 1933 the day after Hitler was elected in the American press, where they say that Hitler gives up on being a dictator in the New York Times, the Cleveland Free Press, the Philadelphia Bulletin, the Inquirer, papers across the country, call him a chaplain as figure, said Hitler's the most hard-working leader in Europe, talked about how the German institutions and the Parliament of the Reichstag would never allow him to proceed with his racist ideology. The very denial that Charles was talking about. We raised the bar on tolerance and we're doing it today again. Here, in America, on university campuses, in other institutions. What was marginally acceptable on the fringes a few years ago is today acceptable in the mainstreams. Descriptions of Jews in Israel and support for Israel in the most intolerable and intolerant ways is being expressed and accepted. And I'll come to it in a minute. And what compounds it, and the seriousness today, as opposed to periods in the past, is globalization. Globalization wasn't just about economics, though we have seen in this last year how strong that is, and that a rogue trader in one country can affect the markets and all others, or a subprime mortgage crisis can explode into a worldwide recession, but it's also the globalization of politics. And that what happens in one part of the world affects what happens in all other parts. That you can no longer look, as we did when we dealt with the Soviet Union, you didn't have to think of what the ramifications were in Indonesia or Venezuela or in Iran. But today you cannot deal with any issue without thinking of what the ramifications are on a global basis. Everything is interrelated. The domestic agenda, our internal agendas, the price of oil affects what kind of terrorism will be carried out. 
Things that were none, one would never have factored into a consideration in trying to devise a policy. Bernard Lewis, the renowned Princeton uh, historian and expert on Islam, said recently that he's more concerned today, you know, he's 93 or 94 years old, that he was more concerned today about the outcome than he was in 1941 when France already had fallen to the Vichy and Hitler was on the move in Europe. It's a pretty bleak statement. But I think coming from him is one that you have to give real credence to. We have seen how the big lie works. We saw the case of Muhammad al dura the poster child of the Intifada, where the whole world condemned Israel for shooting a child. And we all saw the picture of him cowering behind his father until we now know that it was all a hoax. There was no blood, there was no bullets, there was no body. And now the French government, eight years later, finally acknowledges that there are legitimate questions to pursue. After scores of people died in the name of Muhammad al dura we saw it in Janine. 5,000 dead, 3,000 dead, 1,000 dead, and it turns out 55 people killed, 49 of them terrorists. I was in Janine during that fighting. I saw it myself. I stood next to my can of CNN when we saw a film of a funeral taking place, staged for the benefit of the media, and you saw the body being carried and falls off the stretcher. So they gently put it back on. A block later, it fell off again, gently put it back on. The third time it fell off, he got back up himself. <laughs> Look at the film of Muhammad al dura where you see at the end a body being dragged out, and as soon as they thought they were out of camera range, the guy gets up and walks off. There are many cases. Muhammad al dura began the case that gave legitimacy to Israel equals Nazism. To me, the critical document that serves as a guide in beginning to address the issues that I will talk about is a report that came from the House of Commons by three non-Jewish members, published in December of 07, in which he talks about anti-Semitism, they talk about anti-Semitism in Great Britain. It was their initiative. They said we can't remain silent anymore in the face of what we see happening in our own country. And I urge you all to go online and read it. I won't go through it, but there are some important findings. They talk about the poisonous atmosphere on British campuses. They talk about what has happened to the elites in British society. The fact that you can't bring a pro-Israel speaker on most campuses in Great Britain. And they talk about the anti-Semitic attacks. That verbal violence leads to physical violence. And they talk about the record number of anti-Semitic incidents in Great Britain. But the fact that less than 1% of them led to a conviction or prosecution. also found that a Jew was four times more likely than a Muslim to be a victim of the hate crime. This report, I think, is particularly significant because it is the blueprint for what is happening in America. Indifference, apathy, and ignorance, Moses told us, are the greatest dangers that face us, not natural disasters or wars. It's when people become indifferent and don't care. There's no antidote to that. You can overcome enemies, no matter how sophisticated their weapons, and threats, but you can't overcome apathy and indifference. And one of the manifestations of apathy and indifference is when we see the kind of denial, the refusal to confront, the unwillingness to acknowledge the challenges and the kind of dangers that exist. For us, Zahira remembers history. There's no Hebrew word for history in Zahira remembers, which is a much more active form. It's not recalling an incident in a particular place at a particular time, but it's looking at the process of what leads up to things, what happens, and what flows from them. It's only in that process that one can begin to understand the dynamic of a situation and how you can address it. We are seeing a world where increasingly people are not willing to face up to realities. Iran is one example. 
People are telling us now you have to begin to adjust and to learn to live with a nuclear Iran. The leading state sponsor of terror around the world. The leading executioner of children, 160 children sitting on death row in Tehran. Six children already executed this year. The leading executioner of women burning them up to their chests in the middle of Tehran and stoning them to death in the 21st century. Today, Iran is on three borders of Israel. It's not his neighborhood. It's Hamas today in Gaza. It's Hezbollah in Lebanon. And it's in Syria. And all three today are part of the Iranian network. An Iranian network that stretches around the globe, as I will tell you in a minute. But to understand the true nature of what the danger is, Iran is not a threat to Israel, it's a threat to the world, it's a threat to the region, it's a greater threat to Saudi Arabia than it is to Israel, a greater threat to Jordan and to Egypt. It represents an existential danger. Because it's not a local power, it's a regional superpower, not limited by any kind of moral compunction. And a leader who only answers to an imam who died in the ninth century, and driven by a radical ideology. That's what we faced 70 years ago and why we can say that this could be. Because we have an implacable enemy driven by a racist and extremist ideology that Robert Wistrich and Bernard Lewis and others have written extensively showing how Islamism, Islamic extremism, not Islam, and not Muslims, because they are actually the first victims of Islamists, uh, of Islamist uh, extremists. But if you look at the two ideologies of Nazism and Islamist ideology, they are identical. And unfortunately, they share the same goal as well. And the extension of this ideology, whether the Salafis who are moving into Jordan, into Saudi Arabia, into Egypt, when you see Sunnis converting into to Shiitism because they look at the future and see that the radicals are taking more and more of a prominent position, it should give us cause for concern. For eight years, the Europeans engaged in the same kind of appeasement that they did 70 years ago in Pugwash when they negotiated with the Nazis. For eight years, they were humiliated. For eight years, the Iranians bought time to move ahead with their nuclear program. And there is nobody today who does not believe, no reasonable person in the intelligence arena, that it's be more than a year before they have enough for a dirty bomb, and a dirty bomb will be bigger than the one that was dropped on Nagasaki. When you look at the realities of Iran today, all the weapons they purchased, four and eight billion dollars from Russia just in the last two years, and now seeking another billion dollars in weapons. And you see the extent of the terrorist network. Hezbollah operates in 30 countries. If any of you looked lately at South America, Iran today is a dominant force in South America. Four years ago, I went to see the President, the Secretary of State, and begged them to pay attention to this. Not because it's an Israel issue or a Jewish issue, because it's an American issue. Three hours off our coast. Hezbollah has open training camps today in Venezuela. They bring young Arabs from Venezuela and other countries to train in the Bukha in Lebanon. Iran is opening 29 factories this month in Venezuela. They're manufacturing farm machinery. Naval maneuvers taking place off the coast of Venezuela, but it's true in Bolivia, Ecuador, Paraguay, and Uruguay. The Sandinistas in Nicaragua, Cuba, are all aligned together. Because they don't have to fight us 8,000 miles away. And can bring people across our southern border. Terrorists infiltrating our, our southern border. And you're going to say to yourself, this guy is an experienced what he's told about. This is FBI testimony before the Congress of the United States. This is not me talking to you. Read Senator Cornyn in the text testimony about the material they find, our uniforms and other things along the Mexican border. This is not hypothetical. This is real in its today. But it's much easier to ignore it and have our grandchildren pay the price for it. Because the decisions that are made today are not going to be about months or years. These are about generations. The war on terror is going to define the 21st century for us. Do you know how many terrorist operations have been closed in the United States in the last four years? More than 500. Yet this past week, 14 Palestinians arrested in St. Louis for being part of a racketeering thing that was raising millions of dollars to send to Hamas. 
The Holy Land Foundation trial going on in Texas now for month after month. You don't see it written up in the newspapers, but all of you want to go back and read it because it is a blueprint. It's giving you all the details where they say openly how they raise money for Hezbollah and for other terrorist operations. And you're not talking about small amounts of money, cigarette smuggling. It amounts to millions and millions of dollars. And there are hundreds of these operations, and many of them based on campuses across our country. Places like the University of Idaho or Montana. How do people find it? How do they know where it is? Iran today poses an existential danger to the world order. What's doing in South America and its goals to set, spread its message of extremism in other places is tied into North Korea. It's tied in to Cuba. It's tied in today increasingly to Russia. Not because Russia shares the ideology, nor does Russia want to see a nuclear Iran, but because its hatred of the United States and its desire to reassert itself in the past. And as the foreign minister of Russia in a discussion we recently had when somebody made reference to the FSU, former Soviet Union, he said, you mean the future Soviet Union? It is not 1939, for the reasons I stated. And one only hopes that the world would have learned the lessons. But you see the apathy and indifference when things like our four can continue to take place and the world can't manifest and can't put together a response to stop a regime like the Sudanese government. What a disgrace, what a statement. Indifference doesn't stop at borders, and that's why all of us and why the Jewish community has been in the forefront of the efforts on Darfur. Because we understand that hatred against one people is, expands to hatred against all people. So one of my great fears is that the world has learned little in the 70 years. That we haven't learned the lessons of the past. That we're willing to always bypass and look past and not try to confront the evil that we see. Because terrorists by their nature are cowards. They test us all the time. And if they find us wanting, they exploit it. They look for our weakness. But unfortunately, too often they find it. Terrorists, if you notice, terrorist leaders never fight it out. And they never send their own children to die. They send other people's children. Because by their nature, they're cowards. That's why they don't fight on the military grounds. They don't have, engage in military warfare. They attack women and school children and school buses and malls. And the only lesson and the only language that history teaches us is that when you're dealing with cowards, is that you have to confront them openly and forthrightly. I've hardly begun the agenda, but I want to come to one so that there is enough time that we can talk about some of the other issues later. People tend to diminish the importance of incitement. Dennis Ross even acknowledged that one of the mistakes of the Oslo Accords was that they did not deal with incitement seriously. You cannot make peace if you raise generations on hate. And unfortunately today we see, coming out of the Middle East, vile hatred, the portrayal of Jews in ways that would have made Goebbels proud, in ways that he couldn't because he didn't have satellite systems, he didn't have the capacity to communicate the message. Hitler took months to spread the big lie that they had done in seconds. Do you know what the second most published book in the world is today? The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. In the Arab world, there's more than 120 different editions. If you see the portrayal of Jews in the Palestinian media, Palestinian TV, and I'm not talking Hamas, I'm talking Fatah TV. If you look at the Saudi textbooks, even some of them used here in schools in America. If you look at the kind of depictions of Jews in the mass media, in the mosques, in the political arena, in the Arab Muslim world, you can understand that you'll never make peace if incitement isn't taken seriously. I would note for you, take a look at the textbooks in America. The American Textbook Council put out a study recently over the summer where they are self-critical and say we've lost control. You know that there was a textbook used in high school school systems in the United States, not schools, school systems, that said that the Muslims came to America before Columbus. And they became Algonquin Indians. And it shows how Algonquin names are derivative of Muslim names. Mm. You can laugh at it. But 150 school systems were using this textbook. 
until somehow the Algonquins got hold of it. In three days, the books disappeared. Go and look at the study just published about textbooks used. I won't take the time now. About the depiction of Christianity, the depiction of Judaism, the depiction of others, including Muslims who don't agree with them, are also targets. And why I keep saying and emphasizing that it is not Islam that is the enemy. It's those who exploit Islam, who engage in the extremist form of Islam. The reason why, 20 years ago, we spoke about this, and I spoke to audiences about the danger of Islamic fundamentalism when they thought I was from Mars, was because Muslims came to us and said, listen, you will understand, the world doesn't care, but you have to. You, the Jewish community. <coughs> They came to us about what was going on in the prisons in America. They came to us to talk to us about the radicalizations in the mosques. Because they were the victims. Unfortunately, people didn't care. And we see the price that Europe has paid. Look at the riots in Paris. A hundred policemen wounded in three days. 50,000 acts of urban violence in Paris. A thousand cars torched a week. When you have that kind of breakdown in law and order, people can't live there. And it means Christians can't live there, Jews can't live there, Jews are being assaulted every single day in Paris. You cannot walk with the Yamaka in Paris today. You can't walk with the Yamaka in much of London. You can't walk with the Yamaka in Rome. You can in Baku, in a Muslim country. And you can in Almaty, in Kazakhstan. I'm not going to go into this situation in Europe because it will take too long. And it's one that I care very much about because I think the demographic realities have been ignored by European officials and they're going to face a situation where the radicalization of young Muslims, who 70% of the Muslims in Europe are under 25 years of age, and 40% of the births in Europe will be Muslim children, and the governments ignore them, did nothing to try to integrate them, and instead are going to face a critical situation which I think can only lead to more violence and more tension and an increasingly difficult situation. I'm hardly touched on the issue of Iran because I want to come, as I said, to the United States. But there are those who seem to believe that somehow it's called the if only crowd, that if only Israel would somehow make peace with the Palestinians, all the issues would disappear. The fact that the, the Iranians are today trying to force a Sunni Shiite confrontation and are engaging in all sorts of activities on the three islands that they dispute with the UAE in other places. They can claim Bahrain as their 19th province. And their real goal is to take Saudi Arabia and the UAE and control the energy resources as well, in addition to their ideological goal. And you know that Iran faces an election this year as well, an election for president. My only hope is that Ahmadinejad will be reelected. I think he is the greatest gift that we have in regard to Iran. And uh, hopefully the Iranian people will be wise enough to keep him in office. Because frankly, he's no different than Rasmajani or Khatami. The only difference is that they're portrayed as moderates. But they're the ones who gave the orders to blow up the Israeli embassy in Argentina and blow up the Amiyan. They're the ones who started the nuclear program, not Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad just says what they all believe and says it openly. Holocaust denial has been true in Iran for many years. Do you know when Iran got its name? It was in 1935 when they changed it from Persia. They took the Farsi form of the word Aryan is Iran. And it was an identification with the Nazis that that name was adopted. And we had seen, and again, I know the time limitations uh, are great right now. When the chief rabbis of countries in Europe tell Jews that you can't wear outward symbols in Germany and France and Norway and other countries, when Chief Rabbi Sachs, that someone asked about earlier, talks about a tsunami of anti Semitism in Great Britain, we can't dismiss it. And we have to learn from it. What happened in Great Britain was the poisoning of the elites. I tried to speak about this years ago and people did not want to hear it. At least today, people are willing to listen. Because what happened in Great Britain is happening in America. Today, the provisional numbers in Great Britain are between 15 and 17 percent. When asked to name the most disgusting country in the world, more than 50 percent said Israel. When asked to name the two most dangerous countries, Iran and Israel, came up first in Great Britain as it did in other countries of Europe. Because when you poison the elites, it obviously ultimately wears its work its way down to the populace. And so they start with the intellectuals, with the academics, with the cultural elites. 
And it ends up then with big boycotts of Israeli academics. It ends up that you can't bring pro-Israel campus speakers onto campuses. It ends up with the poisoning of the people's attitudes and ultimately leads to anti-Semitic manifestations such as we have seen in Great Britain and other countries of Europe. In the United States, there is a poisoning of the elites going on today. Walt and Mearsheimer are manifestations of it. They're not the cause. They're an expression. The fact that they wrote a pamphlet of 82 pages, 41 pages of footnotes, that no American publisher and six or seven magazines were approached would publish it because it was full of historical inaccuracies, distortions, misrepresentations. And they finally went to the London Review of Books, which sounds a lot more prestigious than it is. And they published it. And I warned at the Herzliya conference that we will look back a year from now and ask, how did it happen? But I was wrong. It took six months, and they got the biggest contract ever given to a Harvard professor, $750,000 advance. Now almost a million copies have been, been sold. They're used on campuses from Harvard to the University of California. I get calls every week from students me, what do I do? How do I answer it? What do I say? I said, well, don't they have any other textbook or articles given to you to counter it? The answer is no. Walt and your timer appear on campuses across the country. They appeared this past week at the dinner or two weeks ago of the CNI, the Council for National Interest, arguably an anti-Semitic organization, as they have before many other similar groups. And they gave the intellectual legitimization to those who want to delegitimize the Jewish state who say that Israel has no right to exist and who blame us and then seek to intimidate us, those who stand up for Israel, Jew and non-Jew alike, because they attack the Christian supporters of Israel as well. Jimmy Carter is another manifestation. He said he entitled his book on calling it about apartheid with Israel because he wanted to stimulate debate, but he's the only guy who won't debate. He won't appear with anybody else on the campus. He won't take questions from an audience unless they're pre-screened. And look at the distortions in his book. Just historical distortions, misstatement of facts. But they have no interest in discussing it. Walt and Mearsheimer had three original sources in their book. I'm quoted here, I'm referenced many times. And reporters asked them, how come you never spoke to any of these people? They said, because we know the answers. Would any high school professor, a teacher, let alone a college professor, give it a passing grade? It's a diatribe against the Jewish people, against the Jewish state, and against the friends of Israel. But it's given legitimacy. You can't dismiss this. That Pat Buchanan can talk about a fifth column in America, can talk about the Israel firsters. Don Imus got thrown off his show because he made an offensive and stupid comment. But Pat Buchanan can call us disloyal Americans by calling us a fifth column. Michael Scheuer, consultant to CBS, and so many others. We raised the bar on what we're prepared to tolerate. Ten years ago, we would never have allowed it to happen. The warriors of God on CNN is depiction about the Jews. A total distortion in an effort to legitimize that Christians and Jews are just the same as Muslims engaging in terrorism. The question is, where are we? Look at the accusations now growing out of the economic crisis. Listen to the talk show hosts who tell you about the calls they get about. We know which ethnic group is behind it. We know that Wall Street is synonymous with Jews, just as neocons were made synonymous with Jews. When our kids at the high school level are inculcated with the kind of information that is in the textbooks that they're using in their public schools and private schools, when you see the kind of infiltration on the campus, today we enjoy the broadest support of the American people for Israel ever. But as broad as it is, that's how thin it is. And if we don't learn the lesson from what happened in Great Britain, we will find the same numbers here. And we can't allow ourselves to be deceived because the numbers aren't real. Claire Lopez, in this week's congressional, this current issue of Congressional Quarterly, an Hispanic who worked in the CIA, and talks about the anti-Semitism in the State Department and the CIA. The case of David Tannenbaum and a dozen others, Jews working in official positions in government targeted only because of their associations with Israel or because they were Jews. And they trialed the two APAC workers who did nothing different than what hundreds of others do every day in Washington. These are real challenges. It's not hypothetical. 
We're going to face this year another Durban conference in April of 2009. You all remember what happened in 2001. A conference that was supposed to deal with the legitimate issues of racism, of bigotry, of xenophobia, turned into a vile demonstration and con convention of hatred against Jews, against Israel, against the United States. That even Mary Robinson, the, the chairman of the conference, had to get up and denounce it and say, I am a Zionist. Believe me, she isn't. But in identification with what happened there, she said it. And many countries walked out. And now they are reconvening it. And what hope can we have when you have Libya in the chair of the planning committee and Iran and Cuba sitting as vice chairs? We saw the prep meetings that took place on Yom Kippur, naturally, so as to encourage our participation. And what they did again was the blueprint that happened in 2001, planned again for 2009. And what happened in the first Durban conference was that we saw the blueprint for everything that has happened since then. The declaration that just as we got rid of the apartheid state of South Africa in the 20th century, we get rid of the Zionist apartheid state in the 21st century. If you look at every single theme that was propounded there, you see it expressed in what happened in Great Britain and what's happening here in the United States. Canada is already now so won't participate. Hopefully other countries will follow suit. The fact is that the international community, which paid such a heavy price for it because the legitimate issues of racism were not addressed by virtue of the fact that our attention was all diverted to this ridiculous uh, agenda that they tried to impose, we paid a heavy price. We see the modern blood libels being expressed publicly. We see the revisionism, whether about the Six Day War or the USS Liberty going into libraries across the country spreading these messages of hate. We see the effort to demonize and delegitimize Israel, the moral right of Israel to exist as a state. Is there any other country that has a more legitimate right to exist as a state? Israel, sanctified by 3,000 years of blood, sweat, tears, prayers, and they delegitimize it? That we see the efforts to deny it and deny those who stand in its support? To always put its sovereignty into question and not demanding a higher standard, which is okay, but a double standard. It doesn't mean that you can't criticize Israel. Israel's is not perfect. Israel's is not Disneyland. Sometimes it's never, never land. But this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about those who do not want to see the Jewish state exist, who blame the victim, who equate the arsonist with the firefighter who put Israel in the same category as those who seek to destroy it. Israel's record can stand against any other country in the world. The efforts to intimidate us and to silence its supporters cannot be allowed to succeed. They, in fact, are very clever because they create a dilemma for us. If we speak out, then Walter Neersheimer say, you see, they're trying to silence us. If we don't, then they say everybody agrees with us. <coughs> So it will take creative approaches of Jews and non-Jews, people who care about truth, who care about the values, who care about democracy, have to speak out. The American democracy demands one thing of us, and that's to be involved. It says if you care, you've got to speak out. We've got to repudiate the message that Israel was born in sin. We've got to go back and tell the fundamental truths and remind people how Israel came into being. In the first parasha, the portion of the Torah that we read this past Saturday, the commentator on the whole Bible quotes his father and says, why does the Bible begin with the story of the creation of the earth and not the first commandment? And he answers, and this is a thousand years ago, he answers that the time will come when there will be the nations of the world will challenge your right to Israel. And you will tell them, look, God created the earth, and he gave this land to us. That's why history is so important. Because a thousand years ago, they already acknowledged and recognized the danger of people coming and saying, you have no right to this land. That academics and others would be able to challenge our right to be there. 
And when it's sanctified by official bodies, when schools have textbooks, when others can give expression to it, when we're told that we have to learn to live with an extremist regime such as the one in Iran, with all of its nefarious activities around the world, when we're told that incitement is not as important as we believe, when you can allow people to make the kind of statements that we hear from public officials, that then convince others who are ignorant and who don't know it, otherwise well-meaning, because they don't have the information to repudiate. Our responsibility is to stand up and tell the truth. It is not 1939. But we have to make sure that it doesn't become and we do that by our vigilance, by our willingness to stand up and speak out and to talk about anti-Semitism, not to cry all the time. I think it's the most powerful charge in the world that has to be used with great care and with great reserve. But when you see it, you got to say it. And we have to be very ready to stand up against those who use the academic cloak and the ivory tower as protection to say that we will not be silent. We owe it to our children and to our grandchildren just as we owe it to our grandparents who didn't see that response in 1939. Thank you. 
question I asked one time before why Russia acts against what's really its best interest in the world. Uh, what's the reason for Saudi Arabia and Jordan and the Arab countries? I mean, obviously, they, they hate Israel, but Iran is, is as much a big threat as Something you have to deal with every day. <clears throat> Jewish organization. divisiveness didn't allow Jews to articulate a strong and sound message in Europe, certainly, and here as well. We see the same thing today. What can we do about it? Um, yeah, one of the things that interested me the most about your talk was the, uh, when you mentioned the, the poisoning of the elite and the sort of um, terrible sort of intellectual atmosphere that is <coughs> Legitimately focus on the legitimate fears uh, of Iran, of you know worldwide anti-Semitism, that and, and, and retreating from you know in those, into those fears, we ignore a lot of the male, moral failings I got in Israel. It that concerns me a lot. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, let me do this briefly. Yes. No. <laughs> But 
The name Tessemite doesn't say Ethiopian Jews, it doesn't help say being Syrian Jews, or Russian Jews, as was the case. So one of the things that we have to do is, is to try and educate people and to do it with greater sensitivity. That too often people, uh, as you saw, even in Israel during an election campaign where they portrayed the Prime Minister in a Nazi uniform. And that leads to the excesses that people react to when legitimate comparisons or legitimate lessons uh, can be learned from that period. So I, for one, believe you have to use it very sparingly. I think you have to use it uh, in the rare instances where the lessons are appropriate to be learned. And that's why I don't engage in debate about the topic is to stop it, is not to focus on what happened in 1939, but what lessons we learned from 19, the 1930s that we apply to today, the mistakes that were made then, both in America and in Europe, by the failure to confront a reality which they knew, which they knew, they saw it every day. My grandparents saw it and unfortunately paid the ultimate price for it because they didn't react in time to, to what, to what uh, they saw. So, I understand the issue you're raising. I think that the, the need to educate this generation, especially younger children, our big failure, I think, is in terms of our high school age children, Jews and non Jews alike, they're not being educated. By the time they get to campus, it's too late. They have to be inoculated beforehand, and we have failed. There is no material for them, there isn't appropriate instruction for them, and with rare exceptions, when you ask them, even those who get a good Jewish education, they're not capable of answering questions any better than the general population uh, uh, is. Uh, what was it about outlawing? Outlawing Islamophobia. Islamophobia, yeah. What, one of the things that they're coming up with at the uh, outlawing Islamophobia, racism against Muslims is okay, but that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about any criticism of Islam, but more than that, they're talking about freedom of speech. They're talking about the uh, criticism of religion of any kind, and they are trying to make that the agenda of this Durban conference. So it's not the criticism of Islamophobia. By the way, I told you the statistic for Great Britain. Yesterday, the FBI published a survey for the United States. In the United States, a Jew is eight times more likely than a Muslim to be the victim of a hate crime. So when you talk all the time about Islamophobia, the fact is that anti Semitism is a far bigger problem here in our own country as well. And by the way, less than 1% of the attacks lead to an arrest or prosecution in the United States as well. So why the analogy to, to what happened in Great Britain? I just happen to have the FBI statistics right here now. And uh, again, they follow the same pattern of the year before. About uh, J Street. So let me put to rest this issue. J Street had nothing to do with the decision about whether Ms. Payment was invited Nothing at all. It's a myth that they created, putting out a thing, we won, they said, I never saw the petition, they told me they had a petition. It's totally irrelevant. They are a marginal group. They can, anybody can go on the internet and get 10,000 signatures to anything. It gets motherhood, for motherhood, against Amplify, for Amplify, anything. It's irrelevant. It had nothing to do with it. The decision that was made at the time was because three of the sponsoring organizations got letters from their lawyers saying that their tax status was jeopardy threatening, and I will tell you the Obama campaign tried to get us a speaker, and that is uh, Wexler, who comes from Wexler, and it was acceptable to them. It was not acceptable to the lawyers. That was the only reason, and we were faced with a choice at the last minute, and our lawyers did not agree with them, nor did the JCRs from New York's lawyers, but it was a choice of either canceling the rally or agreeing not to have speakers. That was the whole thing. It was exploited by many people, it was distorted, it was misrepresented, I would have preferred that it didn't happen, but it had nothing to do with JC. I do think, though, that the creation of these kind of partisan organizations and the kind of broad emotions we saw during this campaign within the community and the partisanship that is being expressed rather than the, the discussion of issues. We've hardly heard a discussion of the critical challenges facing America. We're not talking about it. Economic issues are one thing, but we're not really seeing solutions. We're not hearing people talking about Iran. They're going to say, well, you're going to bomb Iran. No, we're not going to bomb Iran. They're not making a decision about bombing Iran. What about blockade? What about sanctions? What about all the other things that really do work and can matter and make a difference? What are we doing to talk about the future of Europe? What are we talking about what happened in Georgia? What happened in Georgia is a cataclysmic event that will affect us for generations. It was a message to every leader of the Muslim, central Muslim countries. And I was in Georgia in February with the President's Conference. 
anticipating something would happen. Every Muslim leader in Central Asia who was looking to the West turned away the other way to the East because they said, look at this, a Christian country, Georgia is not a Muslim country, it's a Christian country on the edge of Europe trying to get into the EU and into NATO, could be raped by Russia, and nothing was done. Nothing. What do you think the message to every leader? Why did Assad fly the next day to Moscow and say all of a sudden wanted to make a deal and say, you know, we were with you, the Israelis were against you. Why did the leaders in Morocco, of the Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and others all of a sudden say, oh, it's a good thing Russia's back in play because they have a balance? It's not what any of them believe. But they looked at this reality and said the West is impotent. The West can't do anything. Why weren't all these foreign ministers sitting in Gori the day this happened and saying, you're going to attack? We're here. So I think that the partisanship and the kind of uh, the ineffectiveness in terms of addressing critical issues across the board is of great concern to me at, at this time. And I would hope that this kind of partisanship, whether left or right, Democrat, Republican, whatever, the community can't afford it today. We shouldn't be supporting it. The money should, has to go to much more critical and vital issues like keeping the poor, taking care of the needy, and the, all the new poor who are emerging out of this economic crisis and addressing the legitimate issues like support for Israel. Why two-thirds of Jews vote for Obama? You know what the statistics are. We don't know what the real numbers are. The Jews are too small, small a part of the statistics to get an accurate reading. I think that, uh, you know, whether it be 40% or 35%, why don't we wait and see what happens in the election and then we can discuss it afterwards. Um, and they look at many issues. Jews don't vote on a single issue. All the polls show it. They look at, uh, at all different kinds of concerns. The question about Russia acting out of its own uh, interest. Russia's interest in acting and what it's doing in Iran has several factors. One is Chechnya. Don't you think it's interesting that Russia can kill all these Muslims in Chechnya and there's no pieces in the Muslim world? Because they bought them all with Iran. They get a billion dollars a year from the share. They sell them billions of dollars of weapons to Syria and to Iran. And most of all, they're reasserting their place now as a global power. Russia is looking to be the Russian Empire again. And that's why they're building a base in Tartus in, in Syria. For the first time since the communist empire fell, they are now putting the Black Sea fleet into the Mediterranean because they're reasserting their role. This is uh, you know, almost 15, 16 years since they did it. And they are looking to challenge the US any place they can. And that is why two long-distance Russian bombers are sitting in Venezuela today as a message to us in our sphere of influence that we play in theirs in Ukraine and putting missiles in Czechoslovakia and other places, they're going to challenge us. And the really good news of all of this is the fall of the price of oil. Russia needs, you know who the, the number one exporter of oil in the world is? It's not Soviet Arabia, it's Russia. And Russia can only finance all of these aggressive programs. You know, they offered to invest $30 billion in the oil fields of Venezuela. They are uh, put out together a tripartite council with Qatar and with Iran, and in Venezuela it's also with Iran. Now, Gazprom had to borrow $9 billion from the Central Bank of Russia. Iran took in $54 billion in the first six months of this year from its oil, $70 billion wages. In the last three months, it had to take $17 billion out of its slush fund to make it up. It needs $90 oil to have a balanced budget. The budget is based on $75 oil, but it's in fact $90. Venezuela needs the same, $90 oil. So now when the price is going into the 60s, these guys can't do what they did. And that is what's going to rain in Russia, or rain in Venezuela, or rain in, uh, rain in Iran, which reminds us of why energy independence and why energy conservation is so critical, because it empowers guys whose interests go contrary to the interests of the United States, Israel, and all the things that we care about. About Saudi Arabia and Jordan, they do not. They are apoplectic about Iran. And they're doing much to try and counter Iran's influence. Did you think it was interesting that after Israel bombed a nuclear reactor in, in uh, Syria, not one Arab country criticized it? Not one. The only ones who spoke out were uh, North Korea, Russia, Iran, and Syria. The only ones. Why? Because they knew that what Israel did was in their interest. This is saving them. <coughs> And that is why many of them are talking about Iranians have now put forward a plan about a regional security operation, which includes Israel. <clears throat> and why the Saudis are pushing their plan because they want Israel in. Because they have come to realize that Israel is the source of stability and is saving them, not the source of instability and threatening them.
Unfortunately, many of them don't have the courage to do all the things that they should do. The Saudis still export Wahhabism, and uh, the Egyptians still not doing what they should do to, to rein in Hamas. They could stop Hamas from getting all these weapons, and they close down the hundreds of tunnels that are functioning, but everybody's getting paid off, and all these missiles and other material that's coming in, let alone Hezbollah sitting with 41,000 missiles on Israel's northern border, a situation no other country uh, faces. So the Lebanese, who are today just fighting an internal battle, have now given Hezbollah equal standing with the Lebanese army. There's going to be an election there too. Hezbollah is going to try and gain more legitimacy. Syria is looking at this and they depend on, on the Hezbollah because he, Assad trusts them more than he trusts his own army. But he's got 10,000 troops sitting on the Lebanese northern border. These are all situations which are going to affect the future of the Middle East as much as Palestinian-Israeli negotiations or any other issue, and yet nobody is focusing on it, and nobody is dealing with it. That's $160 million to Lebanon with rifles and, and new weapons. Where's weapons going to end up? You got Hamas and Hezbollah, an equal partner, now declared and recognized with the Lebanese army. So the answer is that they are biggest danger to the Arabic Jordan and Egypt they see as Iran. They're doing a lot more than they know about it. And, uh, and it's not just true of them, it's especially true of the Gulf states, where Russia, where Iran moved into the three disputed islands, has set up a base there, which they want to use to block the traffic in the Strait of Hormuz, but it's a direct threat. There are 450,000 Iranians living in the UAE. So believe me, they're not ignoring it. About the stopping of what the Jewish organizations uh, did in the 30s and the divisiveness, my hope is that the, the Jewish community will demand that their leadership, right or left, to, you know, any kind of organization, religious, secular, philanthropic, whatever, the kind of leadership and the kind of direction that they feel meets their needs. If they don't hear from you, then it's your fault, not theirs. Um, what can be done to combat the poisoning? And this comes to a question that says about Hasbara and Israel's activities. Look, it's very Israel, easy to blame Israel and say that they're Hasbara is bad. They're Hasbara is bad, okay. But the fact is that Israel faces obstacles that are almost impossible to overcome. When you have CNN and others in major media and newspapers and all this with a biased reporting, it's not something that Israel can protest and they're going to listen. It's not going to change things. They have to hear from you. And if they don't hear from you, and if you haven't written, and if you haven't spoken out, and just demand the truth, I'm not asking you to be partisan, I'm not saying that you can't criticize it, I'm not saying any of those things. Just give it a fair shake. Tell the truth. Israel's strongest weapon is the truth. Its record can stand against any country, including the United States, in terms of humanitarian appeal. You know, we read all the day, every day virtually, about Israel's closure of Gaza. How many of you know that Israel has sent in 27,000 trucks in the last year or two months? of humanitarian aid, food, medicine, supplies, into Gaza. 27,000 trucks. You think it's a secret? Nobody can see it. But nobody gives it and doesn't report it. 700,000 tons of goods. <coughs> That's not news. It's not interesting. Despite the fact that they try to blow up the trucks and, the, and they have the rockets and everything else. So the answer is it's our obligation to tell the story. I hope you all read the Daily Alert every day. Comes to your computer free every morning, dailyalert.org, it's all from published sources, so that you can call talk shows, write letters to the editors, make your voices heard here on campus, support the students. And somebody's mentioned that the students feel intimidated. You're absolutely right. Because the Jewish faculty doesn't stand with them, and the Jewish faculty does speak out, they are anti Israel. So it's imperative for the community to come in, that people who come here onto campus, stand with students, help them, help them feel the courage to, to speak out, to help them get the material, to have the Resources to help the student organizations of all kinds make their voices heard and help get the message out. Israel can do more. I think Israel, in some respects, has tried the branding with other things that uh, get its message out. But I think it's very important that uh, you know we counter this effort because I will tell you there are a lot of people who don't want to be called Zionists today because we made it a pejorative. It's a pejorative without being called a Zionist. Christians don't have a problem calling themselves Christian Zionists. But Jewish students are like, no, we're not Zionists. We're, we're like Zionists. But we could have been Zionists. My grandparents were Zionists. Yeah. Zionists means they believe in a Jewish state, in a Jewish homeland. Now, why should we be afraid about saying it? But the problem is, we've made it their journey. Just as we've made in many other respects, we're being pro Israel and being safe. <laughs> like lobbying and other things, which are really just expressed.
expressions of American democracy that people should be proud of. When you speak out, that's what America asks of you. And it says that minorities can have a right to have an equal say. You don't have to represent the majority of people who are just disinterested and don't care about most of these issues. The last thing about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, I didn't talk about a lot of things that I had planned to talk about, only if it's a function of time. But, uh, and because right now I think that the conflict is going to be on hold while there's an election in Israel and there's an election in the Palestinian Authority on January 9th, and nobody knows what's going to happen there. At least the Israeli election, you know that they're going to fight each other and then they're ultimately going to sit down, negotiate, fight each other off, and form a coalition. In, uh, in the Palestinian Authority, you could likely have a civil war on January 9th. You could have civil conflict, civil strike. Hamas said they won't accept it. His term ends January 9th. The successor, according to the law, should be the Speaker of the Palestinian Legislative Council, who's Hamas. His deputy is Hamas. They're not going to allow that. He can declare a state of emergency. They may declare an intifada. They may declare violence. Or there may be Palestinian, Palestinian strike, as we saw in the last months, where many people paid with their lives. So I just didn't raise it, uh, only, again, because of time, because of the many issues that I didn't get to talk about. But because it's not an issue separate, you know, this whole idea that somehow the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, if you resolve it, you'll be able to deal with Iran and Iraq and everything else. It's the reverse. You deal with Iran, I guarantee you can solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Hezbollah won't be Hezbollah. Syria won't be a threatening agent. You may be able to make peace with Syria. Syria does not want the Golan behind its back. That's not a son's goal. He needs Israel to be in the Golan right now because he's an Alawite. They represent 11% of the population. He needs a unifying factor. His unifying factor is the fact that we, we organize against Israel. He wants to negotiate with Washington because, and with Jerusalem because they gave him every opportunity to do so. He has first goal is just preserving his regime. The second goal is getting ties with the U.S getting into Lebanon, getting rid of the Hariri investigation. He has a whole list of things. If the eighth or ninth is, is trying to deal with the Golan situation. And now maybe with Iran not being able to provide money and Russia being more limited, maybe he'll start to rethink uh, some of his priorities. So there are, are a lot of issues, but I think we have to put them into proportion. Right now, you don't have a Palestinian authority that can deliver on a peace agreement. He can't. We all support, and people, and I, I've spoken to Fayyad, I've spoken to other Palestinian leaders, they tell it to you very openly, and very blatantly, Fayyad, the Prime Minister. Al Mazen can't deliver. And his forces can't, aren't the ones that are stopping Hamas. If it weren't for the fact that the IDF is in the West Bank, you would not have peace there. And the reason that you don't have terrorist attacks every day is because they're not trying, because they're stopping. I do agree with you, though. We should not ignore extremism wherever it's found. And that's true whether it's in the Israeli Arab community, and we've seen some of the attacks recently there, whether it's in Jewish communities, in the West Bank, or in Israel itself. Uh, I serve on a task force that deals with the problems of Israeli Arabs because I do believe for Israel's future, it's an issue that has to be addressed and addressed in the right way. And I, I think that the, the government has certainly spoken out in very strong terms against the extremists. They've arrested people, old people, sometimes the right people, but I think that as a moral statement, as a democracy, Israel has to act against anybody who violates the law, who breaks the law, and, and uh, whether they're Jews or Arabs or, or Jews or anybody else, that has to be the case. It's interesting to note that more Arabs are signing up for the idea than ever before in Israel's history. And while you read about the criticism, the fact is that more Arabs, Israeli Arabs, are doing well economically and more integrated into society than ever before. There's a lot more to be done. All of the issues that we discuss are opportunities. There is a lot of good news. The fact is that Iran is no longer Israel's problem, it seems the world's problem. There is good news in that we see that Israel today has one of the strongest economies despite all the problems, and that Israel increasingly is being accepted into the region. There are great opportunities. And what we have to do is to remove the blinders. We have to look at the opportunities and be able to speak out against those who are trying to undermine the realities, who are trying to threaten and challenge, and those who try to silence us and intimidate us, and most of all, deny Israel the legitimacy to which it's entitled. And if, in fact, we do that, you will find that the vast majority of the American people who live with us, and I believe today in Europe with Sarkozy, with Berlusconi, with Brown, with uh, uh, Merkel, and others, that the leaders of Europe are with us as well. But we have to.